Thank you all for joining us. I see City Councilor Gene Bergman has joined us. Welcome, Gene. Um, and we've got some great guests here who you'll be hearing from. Uh, and Darren will introduce everyone in a moment. I, I'll just kick things off with a, a few few remarks. Um, <clears throat> we are here to, to talk about our, our net zero energy city roadmap and to share with you the, what has become an annual um, an annual event we're going to share we're sharing today this report which uh, gives an update on uh, on how we're doing it uh, with respect to this plan the city in doing this we're trying to continue what has been a a proud 40-year legacy of climate leadership by the city of burlington and it's been a major goal of this administration for the last decade um, a few examples of that. In 2012, Burlington had fewer than 25 solar installations. Today, we have almost 385 solar arrays, generating well over 9 megawatts of deployed photovoltaic capacity, which is the most per capita of any city east of the Mississippi. And it's, uh, this has been consistent for years now. In 2014, we were, became the first city in the country to achieve the threshold of being of sourcing 100% of our energy from renewable sources. And through these and other actions, what we really have learned as a, as a city, as a community, is that through innovation and action, we can realize here at the local level progress towards a greener, safer, more just, and vibrant future. It was from that observation, that belief, that um, we decided to create in 2019 a roadmap to achieve this net zero energy by 2030, which is, we believe, the most ambitious local climate goal in the country. So in today's update, you're going to see a couple big things in, in the data that we're sharing today. One is that clearly our incentives and our other efforts to electrify vehicles and homes are working and having an impact on, on putting Burlington on a different trajectory, a better trajectory than the rest of the country with respect to uh, carbon emissions. Um, in particular, you're going to see that progress in the gasoline and diesel consumption, where for the third year in a row, we are below the ambitious targets that we have set for decarbonizing that part of the uh, community. You're all also going to see is that we are starting to slip behind our goals for reducing natural gas consumption. And to me, what that means is we need to continue to take forceful, decisive investment and regulatory action to get back on track. So let me say a little bit more about each of those two areas. Um, <clears throat> incentives have been a big part of our strategy for years now. In 2020, we took a big step forward towards the net zero goals by launching the first green stimulus incentives. Right in the early months of the pandemic, we came out with these green stimulus incentives to boost the city's economic recovery um, from the pandemic and to ensure that as the economy was recovering, that we were doing everything we could to transition to electric vehicles, heat pumps, bikes, lawn mowers, and more. There are um, how many is it now, Darren? It's like, the, how many different incentives do we have up on the... Dozens and dozens. It is, it is literally dozens of different incentives for just about every, anything you can imagine uh, electrifying BD can help. Uh, <clears throat> right now is a really good time to do this. It's truly never been easier or more affordable for BD customers to make the leap to electric. And this is true because not only have we continued to make these local investments and to expand these local incentives, <clears throat> Um, you can now combine the local incentives with state and brand new federal incentives when buying a car um, or um, uh, buy, buying a car, buying an electric bike, buying uh, a cold climate heat pump, and again, in, in numerous different uh, interventions that local businesses and in, individuals can do to reduce their carbon impact. Um, what you're going to see in the data, again, is the, is the real impact of these incentives and the collaborations that we um, are setting up in parallel with those incentives with organizations like the partners here today, Car Share Vermont, Champlain Housing Trust, and V-Lite. Um, com this combination of partnerships and incentives is 
is having a major impact, as Darren will walk you through in a moment. But from the, the start of this effort, from the writing of the roadmap, we believe that we need to do more than simply offer these incentives. And we, in parallel, have sought, as a city, new regulatory authority and passed new ordinances aimed at reducing fossil fuel use for building heat, building heat which is the biggest single driver of Burlington's carbon emissions. Um, just to recap some of those steps, Burlington voters took a very strong stand on climate action on town meeting day this year, again, uh, with their second vote and over two thirds voting this time uh, to create the first carbon pollution impact fee in the state. Uh, <clears throat> the voter approved proposal will require all new construction to be fully renewable and will also have new rules for large existing buildings and city buildings that will require the replacement or set up significant um, <clears throat> rules about the replacement of old systems with renewable technologies once those systems reach the end of life in existing buildings. Once implemented, and we are looking to the city council for partnership in getting this implemented, uh, there's a committee that is actively working on this proposal right now and we're hopeful for action soon. Once implemented, Burlington will sh join a short list of U.S. cities regulating the use of fossil fuels for thermal energy and heating. It's really just a handful of other municipalities that do this. <clears throat> Another important step that is very much in our, our sights and we're actively working on and that will go, go straight to the areas of, of challenge that you're going to see here uh, in that we are particularly having challenge in the commercial sector with increased natural gas consumption. Um, the, uh, we are nearing a go, no go decision and have committed to a go, no go decision after many years of work on the creation of a new system to capture waste heat and renewable steam from the McNeil plant and use that captured heat to heat buildings at the UVM Medical Center and possibly the UVM campus as well. We are within months of, of getting to this key threshold and if there is a way to do it given its impact on on our, our, our climate challenges, it, it's certainly something that we're committed to getting done if it's possible to get it done. It's through fiscally responsible, innovative and aggressive tactics like these that Burlington has become a national leader in climate action and it's how we're going to achieve the rest of the, our goals on the roadmap. Again, what this third annual net zero report shows is that local action matters on energy policy and that we still have more work to do to electrify everything and decarbonize our society. And when we do that, when we get that done, we will realize a cleaner, more affordable and a more vibrant future. So now see, we're going to hear from, from Darren Springer, who's really over in charge of much of this effort for the city, as well as some of our key partners in this effort. So Darren. Thank you, th Mayor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're, first of all, very excited to be here uh, at this uh, facility uh, with the car share uh, EV here and the charging station and the new station that's available uh, through the Champlain Housing Trust for uh, folks here in the Old North End uh, to charge their vehicles. Um, this is a partnership between car share v uh, BED and uh, Champlain Housing Trust that you're going to hear more about in just a few minutes. Um, what we're sharing today, and um, we've got a few charts here to illustrate, is our 2022 roadmap update, as the mayor mentioned. Uh, we partner with Synapse Energy Economics, which uh, helped us with the roadmap back in 2019, and we've updated it every year since. And uh, again, our focus is the ground transportation sector and then the building sector. And that's where uh, we're focused on reducing and eventually eliminating fossil fuel use for the city of Burlington and helping to use our 100% renewable electricity uh, to get the job done. Um, so starting with some exciting news, which is uh, on this chart here, uh, you can see that gasoline and diesel consumption, the ground transportation sector, had a significant drop uh, during the pandemic and that we've essentially been able to hold that level uh, even as we've come out of the pandemic, we've reopened, we're seeing more uh, economic activity. The reason for that is uh, a few different things. Uh, one is we are seeing more EVs and plug-in hybrids uh, being registered in Burlington. We are incentivizing more of those vehicles through Burlington Electric. Uh, number two, and very relevant to the partnership here uh, with CarShare, we are seeing fewer car registrations in Burlington relative to prior years. 
So there are less Burlingtonians who are owning a vehicle. Uh, and maybe they're using car share. Maybe they're taking the bus or using walk bike to help get around. And uh, we are seeing less vehicle miles traveled relative to the pre-pandemic timeframe. So that combination has been very powerful and has led us to be uh, ahead of the ambitious pace that we have with the net zero roadmap when it comes to the ground transportation sector. Uh, so that's exciting progress, that's important progress. Uh, transportation remains one of the top two sectors in Vermont and nationally in terms of emissions. And uh, we've made some good headway there. I'm gonna ask my colleague, uh, Mike, to change over uh, to our next chart, uh, which is gonna look at, uh, by residential and commercial sector, our natural gas use in the city of Burlington. Uh, and this really speaks to the building sector uh, fossil fuel use because um, the vast, vast majority of Burlingtonians are connected to natural gas. And what you can see in both the residential and the commercial sector, but more pronounced in the commercial sector, was we were sort of on pace. We had a bit of a dip uh, over a few years, and then we had a flattening and then a rebound. And in, it's a mild rebound relatively, uh, but it's still something that uh, we're looking at here, particularly in the commercial sector. And there are a few different factors that can be at play. Uh, one is this is not weather normalized data. So to the extent that the 2022 early part of the winter, uh, not this most recent winter, but the winter prior uh, was colder than normal, you would see more use of uh, natural gas. So that's one potential driver. Um, also, we know, as, as the mayor mentioned, we have a lot of policy that's in place and more coming uh, affecting new buildings, making sure they're using renewable heating sources. Uh, but there may have been buildings that were permitted prior to that that may have come online. That could be a part of this as well. And then lastly, uh, it's possible that buildings are using their ventilation systems more uh, post-COVID than they were pre-COVID. So there could be a change in building ventilation use. Um, the exciting thing, though, out of this data is we have uh, ready-made solutions to some of this challenge, as the mayor mentioned. Um, having the carbon pricing policy go into effect where all new buildings will be 100% renewable and where large existing buildings can uh, also play a role when they change out their heating systems and city buildings, that will make a dent, uh, particularly here in the commercial natural gas use. Um, so if that gets into place, that will begin to have an impact. Uh, we know our rental weatherization standards were just rolling out for the first time in 2022, and we know there's a backlog of weatherization contractors. So as that ordinance uh, takes effect and as more weatherization jobs get done, that's going to impact on this chart as well. And then last but not least, uh, actually the single biggest step we can take uh, in any sector to reduce uh, fossil fuel use is gonna be in the commercial sector where we can get a 16% reduction in commercial sector natural gas use by moving forward with the district heat system that would bring steam, renewable steam from McNeil uh, to decarbonize uh, large customers such as the hospital and uh, possibly the university, some of their buildings as well. So if you look at this here, 16% uh, reduction uh, just from that single step alone, if we can move that forward. Um, and then lastly, as, as we change out this chart, we'll, we'll kind of zoom out to the bigger picture uh, with total uh, emissions from the ground transportation sector and the building sector in Burlington. And what we see here is, again, a significant drop overall during the pandemic. Um, and then we've seen a very mild rebound overall in Burlington. Um, we, between 2020 and 2022, saw about a 3.2% rebound in emissions. We are still 11.2% lower today in 2022 than we were in 2018 when we started uh, with the roadmap. That's our baseline year is 2018. So Burlington is still 11.2% uh, lower in greenhouse gas emissions in these sectors than we were in 2018. Nationally, we saw a 6.5% jump in uh, 2020 to 2021, and then another 1.3% from 21 to 22. So we're, I think, less than half what the rebound has been nationally uh, here in Burlington. So we are not resting on any of that progress. Uh, we have a lot more work we want to do uh, to help customers switch over to EVs and heat pumps to put in place the policies and the projects that will help uh, kind of further bend this curve uh, back down to the roadmap trajectory. Um, so we're going to hear uh, now, um, speaking of that transportation success, uh, from Annie Borden from CarShare, who we've partnered with on this uh, and many other uh, EVs and plug-in hybrids around the community. And we're so excited to be here uh, at the Old North End Community Center uh, with Annie. So, Annie, please. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. 
Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Fabio, which is our fifth um, all-electric vehicle in our fleet of 25. Um, and we're thrilled to be here. We, we it would be really difficult to expand access to electric car sharing without creative partnerships like this, including CHT making available parking, which is a hot commodity here in Burlington, BED with all of the incentives, and of course, V-Lite for, for funding our vehicle um, and the charging station. Car sharing makes vehicles available um, to hundreds of households in Burlington and now Winooski um, who either choose not to own vehicles or can't afford to own vehicles. And the vast majority of our thousand plus members belong to zero or one car households. Um, and because they own fewer cars, they drive a lot less than uh, typical vehicle owners and they therefore make um, dramatic advancements at reducing the, their vehicle miles traveled, simply by owning fewer cars. If we can make more of those vehicles electric, we're further reducing emissions, but we're also ensuring that, um, that folks who may not otherwise be able to access a v EV can experience them and, and participate in this um, important transition. Um, so we're thrilled to be here. You know, this is our fifth out of our 25 um, cars, and we hope that we can convert more through creative partnerships like this and ensure that people have affordable access to vehicles when they need them, and when they don't, they can find other um, other clean ways to get around. So we're very, very happy. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Um, I also want to recognize Gabrielle Molina from V-Lite. Uh, as Annie mentioned, V-Lite uh, is a partner in funding uh, this infrastructure and this electric vehicle with car share. Uh, they've been a really important partner. I also want to recognize uh, other members of the BET, uh, BED team besides Mike. Uh, uh, we have sustainability uh, director for the city, Jen Green, energy equity analyst, Ita Menno. I think they both arrived on bikes walk in the walk and bike in the bike and uh, and uh, we're really uh, thrilled to have them here um, and also we want to recognize our partner here uh, at Champlain Housing Trust uh, Michael Mello uh, for making uh, this possible uh, and helping us expand access to charging uh, here in the Old North End so Michael if you would sure um, it's the first time somebody's called me Mello oh sorry it's all right <laughs> <laughs> it's right nobody's ever called me Mello before <laughs> Sorry, Mayor. <laughs> um, so it's actually the first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're delighted to have partnered on this project with uh, BED and V Light and also CarShare. We've been a long supporter of, of CarShare. Certainly, uh, we rent to CarShare down in Burlington. We try to keep the rents low enough uh, so that they can sustain their organization and do their work. Uh, our mission is to develop a, a low income, affordable housing uh, throughout. Uh, the Chittenden County, Franklin, and Grand Isle counties, but also to create community assets uh, when necessary and where, where it's important to do so. We did that here at the Old North End Community Center. We own this property and we've rented both to the city, AALV, and a group of other organizations. Happy that Chip from CHT staff was able to work with CarShare uh, and with BED on creating these, these chargers. We're committed to the work. Uh, we have 23 charging stations at 11 different multifamily properties throughout the region. We have more multi, uh, more solar hot water arrays now in Roos than anyone at this point in many of our properties. Um, we probably uh, we have two charging stations and two EVs at our, our headquarters that actually staff use exclusively to get around town with. Um, and we, I, we pay our staff $30 a, do a month to walk a bike to work. I don't know if anybody does that, but we are committed to making sure that people use their cars less and use walking and biking more. So we're happy to be able to partner here, looking forward for other opportunities as we continue on our journey and the work we do at CHT. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think, uh, Mayor, we're happy to answer some questions. Great. Yeah, it's this is a big, a big issue. It's certainly a big issue regionally, nationally, and, and at the local level. We've been trying to get out ahead of this for some time now. You may remember that the um, uh, electrification uh, bonds that uh, we went to the voters for approval for in what was it, the fall of uh, December, uh, December uh, 21. 21. Um, and that passed, it was $20 million, and included in that was funds for making investments in the BED infrastructure. And those investments are underway. Do you want to share any detail about that? 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, in fact, part of the uh, net zero revenue bond is really at work here with these incentives because by making the bond proposal, we created liquidity to, to do more with our incentives. Um, but we are uh, focused on making sure we stay out ahead of where customers are in terms of adding electric use. What we've seen is a lot of electrification happening in the residential sector. Uh, you know, folks who are buying EVs or, or buying heat pumps or, or electric lawnmowers. Uh, we've seen less happening so far in the commercial sector, although we have great examples of uh, ground source heat pump geothermal systems at places like Hula. Uh, and we know that the new high school is going to be looking at that as well. So we're expecting more uptake in the commercial uh, sector as well. Um, the good news is we have a grid that was built to accommodate electric resistance heat back in the 1970s and 80s. And we've moved away from that. We're more efficient now. So there's some headroom in our existing system already and we're taking advantage of that as we move towards electrification uh, we are making investments as well to take our grid from being a roughly 80 megawatt capacity grid up to an interim step of around 102.3 megawatts and eventually potentially 120 or so megawatts if we fully electrify uh, the entire system and we are looking at opportunities uh, for a net zero revenue bond 2.0 uh, that could happen uh, when the current uh, iteration expires um, in the next couple of years so we're going to continue to want to invest in the system for that reason. Parking is a big deal in Burlington. Um, but these electric car share charging supports, are they only on CHT property or are they spaced around the city on public roads too? They're definitely not only on CHT property. Um, there, there are there, this, there are five different ones, but go ahead, Annie. Why are you probably? Yeah. <laughs> so we have we have. Um, dedicated chargers uh, and public city parking, on-street parking, at two CHT properties um, at Cathedral Square Corporation. Um, I'm trying to think what others. That, oh, oh, oh it's CHT. Soon, soon to be the Marketplace Garage downtown. And all of our vehicles are parked either on street, thanks to the city of Burlington, or in public garages, or thanks to partnerships with um, housing partners like CHT. Um, and other private property owners. So we have all, we're really uh, fortunate that CarShare has access to very affordable at no cost. It, there is a cost to the public, to, to us, to, to, you know, everyone pays for parking, but um, that's how we access our parking and have dedicated spaces for our vehicles. I think it's important to remember, it can be, if you're not a, I've been a CarShare member, we're just, I think since 2007 or 2008. So um, very early on, we're one car household, um, so I'm always excited to see a new, uh, new pod opening up. It, I, I, I imagine people who are not members, they might see a space being taken up by car share and think of that as somehow a lost space. But I think what's important to remember is that the whole essence of the, this shared service is that it dramatically reduces the overall parking load. When you have, instead of you know, 15, 20 households, uh, each needing to park their vehicle somewhere when you have that just the occasional use of a shared vehicle the impact of that household on on overall parking is you know this, this is something that really brings down the overall parking pressures dramatically it's one of the great things about the service yeah one vehicle that we put into service really removes 15 from the road at the rate that our members shed vehicles Great. I'm glad I, I was worried I was making up that 15 out of the out of thin air but it sounds like uh, it was in the ballpark. Pushing EVs for people in general, but many people can't afford to go buy a new car. Can you talk a bit about the importance of car share with that accessibility? Sure. No, you go, go for it. <laughs> um, that's a great point. So, um, car sharing it exists to make vehicle access more aff affordable. That's a huge part of our. We're a nonprofit organization. That's part of our social mission, and a growing portion of our of our members, particularly since the start of pandemic, come from households with low or very low incomes. And Car Share Vermont provides free memberships to these households and makes our vehicles available. Um, the minimum reservation is 30 minutes. So people are using our vehicles to access groceries, access medical care, get to appointments, visit family, um, without the high cost and burden of a vehicle that sits parked, you know, 98% of the day. Um, this vehicle, Fabio, right here, it's, it's pretty new to our fleet, and it already last month in the month of May went on 75 unique reservations. That means multiple households every day were using it to meet their needs that they may otherwise 
struggle to without access to a vehicle um, and that it's a zero emission vehicle is awesome. So shared ve car sharing in general reduces demand for vehicles in VMT and makes them more affordable, um, but putting EVs in a, in a shared fleet definitely makes access to EVs more affordable because folks may not otherwise, despite the generous rebates, be able to afford a new car. So that's a great point. I do think it's, go ahead, Michael. I, I was asked to bring up an important point. This particular charging station here is available to folks who work here during the day, but after 5 p.m., anybody in the, in the community can come and charge uh, and use the station. So just that it know, knows this is a public charging station now, too. After hours. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, also make the point I think it's important that the, the media understand, the public understand that the kind of old ideas we have in the head about our heads about the expense of electric vehicles is really changing rapidly. And um, that has particularly, this happens, this is, a, one of the, this is one of the ways we are going to win this battle against the, the climate emergency is that the various technologies really get better and more affordable over time. We've seen that happen in the in the solar space dramatically. Um, part of the reason that we've gone from 25 solar installations to 385 is because we focused on it with local policies and local uh, action, but a big part of it also has been just the dramatic reduction in expense. This expensive installed PV has dropped something like- 90 plus percent over you know, 20 year period. Yeah, and uh, if you go back a little farther than that, it's come down 99%. Um, so something similar is happening with electric vehicles now. Uh, it, 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 it's happening kind of through the market and on the technology side, and it's certainly also being given a big boost with these incentives. So, um, you know, I think when just to use this, to, I, I said in my remarks, there's never been a better time for Burlingtonians to go all electric. Just to give an example of that, we've used before. Right now, um, with uh, we, you want to? Can you still have the Chevy Bolt uh, yeah. math in your head there? Yeah. Is, is so this, is this a Bolt? No, this, this is, is a uh, Bolt uh, EUV. So okay. this is a little bit bigger version of the Bolt. But we've got the regular Bolts are uh, over here, and uh, so one of those vehicles is going to be somewhere in the low thirty thousand dollar range. Uh, BED offers that's the sticker price. That's, that's a sticker price. Yeah, that's just from the manufacturer. Um, BED offers up to $3,000 rebate, uh, income qualified for one of those vehicles. Um, and then you add on uh, another 4,000 or so from the state rebate and up to 7,500 from the federal rebate for vehicles that qualify. And you potentially on a vehicle like that might take half of the price. Um, and you might be looking at getting a brand new vehicle that has a 250 plus mile range uh, for 15 or $16,000, uh, which is about as good a deal as you'll find for any vehicle anywhere in the market, uh, much less than a vehicle that has a uh, zero emissions. Yeah. Right, and, and we have charger rebates too, uh, as well. So we can help you put in a home charger and there's tax credits for that as well. And I think GM even makes one available for free. So a lot of good options with the charging And then well. it becomes more affordable once you own it as well because there's far less maintenance uh, in an electric vehicle. And if you sign up for, if you get a BED charger and you uh, <coughs> sign up for the preferential rate, you can, uh, what is it, up to about 70, 70 cents. About 70 cents a gallon is the equivalent for recharging your vehicle at, at night. So um, the, the economics around electrifying everything are really changing dramatically. And there's similar stories taking place with all these other products as well. Okay, um, thank you all for being here. If there's no more questions, I think we'll call it at that. Um, I want to say thanks again to our partners for, for being here and moreover for, for the work moving, moving forward. This is I th something that it's, we should always keep in mind with this net zero energy goal. This is not just a municipal goal. This is a community-wide goal. We're not going to get there without everybody uh, <clears throat> seeing the opportunity, seeing how this is a better future that we can create. And I really appreciate these partners helping us create that future. Thank you, Thanks, everybody.